scripture reading this morning will be from Genesis chapter 18, verses 22 and 23. Genesis 18, 22 and 23. Then the men turned away from there and went toward Sodom, while Abraham was still standing before the Lord. Abraham came near and said, We do indeed sweep away the righteous with the wicked. In the verses that follow, the verses that were just read just a few moments ago, Abraham goes on and it almost seems like he's negotiating with God. He uh, is trying to get God talked down. Because God has told Abraham that he was going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. And of course, Abraham knew not only that Lot and his family lived in Sodom and Gomorrah, but Abraham obviously had a certain heart for the people who lived there. And his concern was that God was going to destroy those two cities and the towns were around them. And that it was going to be incredible, a incredible loss of life. So Abraham tries to do a little bit of negotiation. And it's a rather interesting passage of scriptures that are, that, that are there. And it, it almost sounds as if Abraham thinks he can trick God and back him into a corner so that maybe he might be able to uh, save these people. Uh, and maybe even save these two towns. And God goes along with him, makes some, makes some promises to him. That he would not destroy the town for 50 people, he would not destroy just for 50 righteous men. He would not destroy for 45, for 40, for 30. Abraham gets him talked all the way down to a number that when you think about who God is, God already knew how many righteous people were in Sodom and Gomorrah. And we know how many were let out of Sodom and Gomorrah. Four people were let out of Sodom and Gomorrah below the number that Abraham talked God down to. You know, it's one of those things where you've got to be, you got to recognize who you're dealing with. And I don't know what Abraham was thinking, but God knew exactly what he was doing. God does destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. And one of the things that Abraham didn't ask him was, well, could you lead the righteous people out of Sodom and Gomorrah before you destroy them? Because we know that's exactly what God does. God leads a what I say Abraham earlier, Lot and his wife and his two daughters out of Sodom and Gomorrah and destroys Sodom and Gomorrah. But the question, the question that is asked there in Genesis chapter 18, through inside the negotiation, Abraham asks God, shall not the judge of all the earth Deal justly. That's the question I wish for us to consider today. We need to know God to the best of our ability. Because this question is an important question that can be answered and should be answered for us. There's a lot of mis un misunderstanding in the world about God. What it means that he is judge. The character of God. What God will and will not do. And quite frankly, when you look at the Bible, you find out exactly what God will do and what God will not do. And we recognize, we want to recognize that today as we go through our study uh, about God dealing justly with the earth. First point, the mo God is the most qualified judge ever. When you, when you consider that question, will God, will God judge justly? First off, we've got to realize about his qualifications. His qualifications in order to be judge in the first place. God's more qualified than anyone. There is no judge with more wisdom than God. Remember what Solomon asked God for? Solomon asked God for wisdom so that he might be able to lead, to judge God's people to the best of his ability. And God gave 
Solomon wisdom. And it's recognized there was never a man more, more, with more wisdom before Solomon, and there was never a man with more wisdom after Solomon. But there is a God that has more wisdom than Solomon. God gave Solomon his wisdom. And so you cannot give to someone without having at least as much as the one you're giving it to. And we recognize, of course, that God has even more wisdom. In 1 John chapter 1, verse 5, we, find, we read these words. Go, go with me to 1 John chapter 1, verse 5. Here we see John, the apostle, explaining about Jesus Christ coming to the earth. In 1 John chapter 1, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, that's in John 1. Go to 1 John 1, 5. We are going to see 1 John we are going to see John chapter 1. 1 John chapter 1 verse 5, we find out God is light, and in him is no darkness. Then when we go over to John chapter 1 verse 9, Jesus Christ came into the world in order to bring light into the world. Look at verse 9. There is the light which cometh, come, is coming into the world and enlightens every man. And when you go to verse 18 of that same chapter, you come to find out what that light is he's talking about. Look at verse 18. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten God is in the bosom of the Father. He has explained him. Jesus Christ came to bring light into the world. We recognize that light is the truth. And so when God says, I am the light, Within the context, and by the way, when Jesus is called the Word in the very beginning, we know that the truth is the light. We know God is the light. We know that since God is truth, Jesus Christ calls himself that. In John chapter 14, verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. You cannot separate the two. So who better to judge than the one who not only knows the truth, but one who is the truth? God, there is no one who can judge with more wisdom because God is that wisdom. Secondly, there is no judge with more insight. God knows all the facts. Go with me to Jeremiah. We're going to do some ter page turning today. Go with me to Jeremiah chapter 23. Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 24. Of course, we recognize Jeremiah, as we oftentimes call him the weeping prophet. Jeremiah was a prophet who, who took the word of God to his people, and his people did not listen. But look what we see in verses 23 and 24 about God. Can a man hide himself in hiding places? So I do not see him, declares the Lord. Do I not fill the heavens and the earth, declares the Lord. Where is a place that God is not? You know, in our court system. When we are wishing to try someone, it's very important for us to have witnesses. Even though the people who are doing the judging, perhaps you have a jury who was not there, they depend upon what the witnesses saw to be able to make their verdict on that, on that person. Well, God is going to be our judge. And where can we go that God is not there? That latter part says, do I not feel the heavens and the earth, declares the Lord. If we could get into a spaceship and travel billions of light years from here, we still could not escape the witness of God. God witnessing what we are doing, where we are going, what we are thinking. We're going to see here in a few moments. But God has insight. The judging that he's going to do is because he knows what we have and have not done. God, that's what I said a moment ago, knows all of our intentions. In Genesis chapter 6, verse 5, when God decides to destroy the world in Noah's day with water, the reason he decided to destroy the world in Noah's day was because all the intentions of the heart of man were evil continually. Do you recognize what that is telling us about God? God made the decision to do that because all the thoughts of man were wicked continually. What did God continually know then? The intentions of a man's heart. There is nothing we can think 
There is no, nothing that can be our motivator that God doesn't already know. And so well, God knows our intentions. In John chapter 2, verse 25, Jesus did not, did not uh, allow himself to be, uh, let me read that, I, I'm, I'm not quoting very well. Jesus knew what was in the heart of man, and that's why he did not allow himself, as 2.25 says, he did not entrust himself to man because he did not need to, anyone to testify about man. He knew what was in man. You see, Jesus Christ, God, knew the intentions of man. And so there is no judge with more insight because God knows all the facts and God even knows what we're thinking and why we did what we did. There is no judge with more strength of character than God. God cannot be bribed. You know how I know that? The Bible doesn't say God cannot be bribed. Well, actually the Bible does say that. Go to Psalm chapter 50, verses 10 through 12. And look at what God says about the sacrifices of the people in his day. Psalm 50, verses 10. Through 12. Speaking of the sacrifices, in verse 8, he says about their sacrifices, their burnt offerings. And, uh, let me start with verse 8. I do not reprove you or your sacrifices, and your burnt offerings are continuing before me. I shall take no young bull out of your house nor male goat out of your folds. For every beast in the forest is mine, the cattle on a thousand hills. I know every bird in the mountains, and everything is mine in the fields. It's mine. If I were hungry, I would not tell you, for the world is mine, and all it contains. How can you bribe a God, anyone? You ever, you ever say those words? How do you buy something for someone who has everything? Well, quite frankly, those words are irrelevant. They don't mean anything. Because no one on this earth has everything. So you can buy something for anyone on this earth. Except you can't get anything for God. It already belongs to him in the first place. So how could you possibly bribe him? Okay. God will not hold a judge, a grudge. In Hebrews chapter 8 verse 12, recognizing what a grudge is. There is a time when we are able to be at someone's mercy because we have done something to them. That includes God. When we sin, we transgress. We have, a, we have a debt that needs to be paid. But when that debt has been paid, a grudge is something held unreasonably. The fact that someone has hurt me and I'm never going to forgive them. God doesn't do that. God gives a way of being able to be forgiven. And in Hebrews chapter 8, verse 12, the prophecy there that the Hebrew writer is quoting from, in the Hebrew writer makes it clear, is, is what is true right now. And the fact of the matter is, God doesn't hold anything against us. It says there, I will remember their sins no more. Well, it's not that God suddenly gets amnesia. What it means is, God doesn't hold a grudge. You sinned against me, but when that sin was paid for by my son dying on the cross, I will not hold that against you. What better judge can you have than that? There's an old joke, preacher joke, about a man on his way to court. And he's in a rush to get there. And he's, and he's uh, having a difficulty because there's a guy who's driving slowly in front of him. And so he passes by the guy who's driving slowly in front of him because he wants to get there in plenty of time, plenty of time to be able to get mentally prepared for, his, for being there. And as he's going by, he makes some kind of obscene gest gesture to the guy driving the car. When he gets there, he gets inside, gets himself mentally collected, makes certain that he's dressed well, looking good, straightened up, goes into court, and guess who his judge is? The guy that he got so angry with on the road. Now, a guy judge who judges correctly wouldn't hold a grudge, would he? 
but the man was wanting to throw himself at the mercy of the court. It doesn't sound like the mercy of the court was going to be quite merciful that day. But God will not hold a grudge. He will not allow his, his judgment to be swayed because of who we are as opposed to who he is. He will judge justly. Secondly, that idea, God is the most ju just judge ever. God is a God of balances. If you go to uh, Psalm 16, verse 11, go there, uh, Proverb, Proverbs 16, verse 11, and look at what it says there in that proverb. There's, there's several places in the Proverbs where you will see something along this line, and that is how God is one who wants a just balance. Now, in saying that, sometimes we think God gets so involved in everyone's lives and he's worried about the balances. You know, they use balances in that day to be, able to, to be able to decide how much a person would pay for a certain poundage of whatever you're buying. We, we do that today. You know, in the meat departments, we'll weigh it. You've got to pay per pound. Well, in, in our day and time, we have, some, we have people who go around and certify the scales to make certain that you're not being cheated. In their day and time, God was the one who wanted to certify the scales. He told, he told his people that they were not to have a false scale. But God makes it clear why that is important. Look at verse 11 of chapter 16 in Proverbs. A just balance and scales belong to the Lord. All the weights of the bags are his concern. Why is that? Because God is a just God. This is more than speaking about his idea of making certain that people didn't cheat others with false scales. It's showing the type of attitude that God has. And if, he, if you're going to have a judge, you first want a judge who's going to judge you justly if you have any chance whatsoever. And God, justice is God's concern. Making all things new is his purpose. See, First thing is, we recognize that all sin and fall short of the glory of God, don't we? We heard that verse earlier in, in the reading of our communion uh, uh, services. But we, we recognize that um, all sin and fall short of the glory of God. So if God is a God of justice, that's a concern for me, as well as it is a concern for you. But God has made a way of fixing the mistakes that man has had. And in Revelation chapter 21, verse 5, at the very end, following the following judgment day, God has fixed everything. And in verse 5, he says, Behold, I am making all things new, fixing the mistakes that man has made. We, we recognize how he fixes the mistake of our sins. So when God is a just God, but God also provides a way for the sins to be taken care of. We'll be talking about that in a few moments. But justice is certainly his concern. But fixing the things that have been done is also God's concern. For, for the one being oppressed, this does bring hope. In Psalm 103, turn to Psalm 103, verse 6. Almost, I, I, when I got to this chapter, I almost considered going over a good portion of this chapter. Uh, with my third point, but uh, ended up not doing that. Because within here, we see the care, the concern, the love of God. That's the third point we're going to look at. But specifically in verse 6 of chapter 3, we read this. This is a praise of the Lord. Uh, it's, a song, it's a song by David. The Lord performs righteous deeds and judgments for all who are oppressed. We spoke a little bit ago about that idea of God being a God of balances. God takes care of those, for instance, under the old law, God took care of those who would not care for the widows and orphans. That was a requirement of the, of the uh, Jews of his, of, under the law of Moses. And that was because God recognized that there are people among his people in the old covenant who weren't going to be able to take care of themselves. And so he takes care of those who are oppressed. We recognize also, of course, that God brings vengeance on those who do evil upon his people, upon others. Uh, yeah, upon others. 
Vengeance, God says, is his. It belongs to him. We are not to take it, but God certainly will. He, he takes care of those who are oppressed, and therefore that gives the oppressed hope in God. The fact that God, justice is God's concern. Of course, on the other hand, for the one who is unrighteous, for instance, the one who is doing the oppressing, this brings about judgment. Look at Zephaniah. I, I'm kind of proud of this. I don't normally go to Zephaniah in, my study, in our studies. But Zephaniah is one of the last four books of the Old Testament. And I actually found something in, in one of these four books that I don't normally use that is very relevant to our, to our lesson today. Zephaniah is a, is, is a prophet. He was a prophet who was prophesying about the judgment that God was going to bring on the nations, including Judah. The judgments on Judah's, Judah's enemies, most certainly, though. In and then in chapter 3, the judgment he's going to be bringing upon Jerusalem and the nations. But look at what it says in Zephaniah 3, 5. The Lord is righteous within her, speaking about Jerusalem. He will do no injustice. Every morning he brings his justice to light. He does not fail. He does not fail. But the unjust knows no shame. And it goes on to, to show there that the unjust have a reason to fear the judgment of God. So God being just is certainly a blessing for those who are oppressed. And God being just is certainly a, something to be feared for those who are unrighteous. Mercy comes through justice, however. In Matthew chapter 27, verse 46, Jesus is on the cross. He cries out to, the, to God the Father. And he says, uh, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. And that was Aramaic. It goes under this. Matthew, Matthew tells us the translation, which means, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now, we know why that was, don't we? Why had God forsaken Jesus Christ? Well, because we sin. And the just part of God required payment for that sin. And so Jesus, who was the Lamb of God, who God sent in the world to seek and save that which is lost, and at the end of his mission to die for that which is lost, was the payment. God's justice demanded someone to die. And Jesus, being the perfect Lamb of God, was able to take our payment, our punishment, to make the payment so that we might be able to have salvation. Mercy most certainly on who? On us. Not on Christ. We receive the mercy. Jesus Christ received our justice. The fact that God is the most just judge ever required a payment. And Jesus paid that payment. Thirdly, God is the most loving judge ever. Now, lots of people have a difficulty with justice and love going together. And one of the reasons they have a difficulty is because of 1 John. 1 John chapter 4 tells us God is love. You know, it's rather ironic that they look at 1 John chapter 4 and see that God is love when 1 John chapter 1 says God is light. God is light and God is love. We talked about that idea of God being light means that he is the truth. And he's the perfect one to judge us because he has the truth. But most certainly, God is love. And those two things do not come in conflict. His love is demonstrated. We said a few moments ago that mercy was at the cross. Uh, that that uh, justice came through the cross. Certainly mercy was shown for us. And the reason for that mercy was because God loved us. Look at loves us. Look at Romans chapter 5, verse 8. Romans chapter 5, verse 8. But God demonstrates his own love towards us. How? In that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. 
As we said, because of his justice, Jesus had to die. Because of his love, Jesus had to die. Because his love was not going to overcome his light, and his light was not going to overcome his love, they go hand in hand. They are the same. But Jesus was the demonstration of God's love on the cross. And so he is the most uh, loving judge ever, even though he is the most just judge ever. He has a great love. Go to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 and 5. This is, by the way, the, the next set of verses I thought was interesting. The next set of verses mentions that great love as well. So this first set and the second, next set of verses I'm going to give you is going to talk about how his love is great. But there's something else to see in the next set. Look at verses 4 and 5. But God, being rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ, by the grace you have been saved. Now, he doesn't mention it there, but we've already noted it in previous verses. We already know it anyway. Jesus died on the cross for our sins. Why? Because God is just. Why else? Because God is loving and merciful. He has a great love. That's why Jesus Christ died on the cross. He, has great, he is a very just God. That is why Jesus Christ died on the cross. The two go hand in hand. And his great love is shown most famous verse in the Bible. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Jesus was his beloved son. He loved him. But he's, his love for the world, he allowed to be great, giving his son. He has a great love. Now go to the next set of verses I wanted to tell you about. 1 John chapter 3, verse 1. 1 John 3, 1. As I said earlier, in 1 John we have God is love. But look at the verse that's with that there in verse 1. See how great a love the Father has bestowed on us that, he would be, that we would be called children of God and such we are. For this reason the world does not know us because it did not know Him. God has, uh, ha lavishes his love on us to an incomprehensible, but it's incomprehensible to the world. They don't know us. They don't understand us. They don't understand why we are the way we are. They don't understand why God is the way he is. Again, they wish to see God as merely loving and not just. And they don't want to see his justice. They don't want him to extend, to apply his justice. But he lavishes his love on us and allows us to be saved by the death of his son. And his love never fails. Now, I'm not going to read the entire chapter, but you're going to get the point after the first couple of verses. Go to Psalm 136. It was very tempting to just sit here and read the entire chapter, but I think you'll get the point after the first, oh, let, let us do five or six verses. How's that? You'll get the point. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. For his, ever, for his loving kindness is everlasting. Give thanks to the God of gods, for his loving kindness is everlasting. Give thanks to the Lord of lords. For his loving kindness is everlasting. To him who alone does great wonders, for his loving kindness is everlasting. To him who has the he who made the heavens with skill, for his loving kindness is everlasting. To him who spread out the earth above the waters, for his loving are you getting the point? We could go if, if, if you look ahead, every verse says the same thing. His and the key old King James reads, His love never fails. His loving kindness is everlasting. God loves when He is giving us blessings, and God loves when He is putting out punishment. His love doesn't change. He's the most loving judge ever. 
And he wants us all to be saved. And so because his justice required payment, his son paid that justice. So the question is this. Shall not the judge of all the earth deal justly? And of course we know the answer. Yes, he shall. God will, does, always has, always will judge justly. We like to be able to tell God exactly how he ought to treat us, don't we? And we get this idea that we know exactly how it should be done. And we are so much like little children who expect their parents to discipline them their way. When we don't, when as little children do not understand the importance of being corrected. And we, as we as human beings, sometimes can't understand it either. Once we recognize that God has the wisdom to do it right, we need to depend upon him and his wisdom to be able to judge us correctly. Do you trust his judgment? By, by the way, whether you trust his judgment or not, his judgment is going to come. His judgment is continuing to happen today. And in the end, when the great judgment, it will occur, and it will occur righteously, justly, and lovingly. Are you ready for that judgment to come? If you're not a Christian, God has made a way for you to take care of what we all know we all have done. The Bible makes it clear, so God knows it. All sin and fall short of the glory of God. What are you going to do about it? Because God is going to require payment. And he's willing to allow you to take advantage of the payment that Christ has made. But that means you must accept his way for that payment. That payment. If you're not a Christian, you need to believe in the Son. Repent of your sins. Confess him. Be baptized for the purpose of your sins being forgiven. And then as a Christian, live with God. Follow him faithfully until the day you die. Once again, recognizing that he's willing to forgive even the sins we commit after our salvation if we will just come to him. If there's any way at all that we can help you this morning, let us know as we stand and sing. By the way.